Hello everyone. This week we're talking about Permutation City by Greg Egan, and Brent is going to give you the setup. Paul Durham has begun experimenting on his own mind. He uploaded a copy of his neural patterns, everything that makes him who he is, into a computer simulation. The more he experiments, the more the lines between the real person and the virtual person begin to blur. And what he discovers there, out at the edge of consciousness, gives him an impossible idea. A permutation city, where immortality might be possible. I'm Cody Troyer. And I'm Brent Gaysford. And we are the Hugo Nuts, here to review and discuss with you the best sci-fi novels of all time. Permutation City is 352 pages, or about 13 hours on audiobook, and was published in 1994. The subsequent year, it won the John W. Campbell Award for Best Novel and the Philip K. Dick Award for Best Novel, because it's pretty interesting. And don't forget to subscribe or follow or whatever platform you're on so you don't miss next week's episode, where we will be ranking the top sci-fi novels of all time. The definitive list of the best stuff, so you know what you gotta read. Anyway, okay, so that's next next episode, uh, which also will be in three weeks. We're switching to three weeks for episodes here, um, at least for a little while. Um, and Because uh, yeah. of babies. Because of babies, which. also it's the holidays, you know. Um, and on the note of babies, thank you everybody who sent well wishes. It was so sweet. My baby's okay. Surgeries, you know, surgery happened. Recovery seems like it's going well. It seems like you might be just like cured, was well, more Whatever, there's always more medical stuff. But I think you might be cured. I'm very excited. Um, so anyway, thank you, everyone. It was a hard time, and the messages really meant a lot. I'm very excited, too. <laughs> All right, should we talk about Permutation City? Yeah, what did you think of it? I gave it a four out of five. Um, it has some wildly compelling ideas. Uh, one of those books that kind of makes you think about everything around you differently, probably forever. Um, and it did not have many characters that, stuck with me how about yeah. you <laughs> i totally agree yeah uh, also four out of five for the same reasons totally mind-bending um yeah i could not keep track of the characters as we were discussing you know making the episode it was like oh who are the characters I, you know i don't know i never learned their names they're all indistinguishable and the dialogue is sometimes just truly awful but anyway yeah so let's let's get into the good stuff yeah. what'd, you, well, what'd you like well, about let's, it? let's start with the ideas that are you know non-spoilery like the the upfront back of the book type stuff, the the big thing. Uh, copying yourself, what it would be like to be digitally cloned. Yeah. If you, if you take it to the utmost confusion, you know, uh, the furthest edge, if you say it's as hard as possible to, to simulate a human brain, you can still do it, right? You could simulate every atom in your brain in the position that it's currently in, and then that would be you would be, it would be thinking the same thoughts as you, right? Yeah, so technically it's, it's Turing com computable, the brain. Yeah, exactly. So how far you have to go out, like what level of abstraction do you have to model the atoms or could you just model cells or could you model, model higher, higher level stuff? In any case, so the idea is they can do that and they can scan your brain also. And so you create, at that moment, you create a scan that you're sort of splitting yourself. And so one version of you then is on the outside in your body and the other version is like in this computer simulation. Um, also yeah, in also idea. in your body though, which is the other point that that's interesting about it is that in the simulation, it's also simulating your body and your, your senses. If, if the person decides to do it that way. Yeah. Um, Which it seems like pretty much everybody did, right? There weren't any like, just like floating minds. They were all in bodies in virtual environments, right? Yeah. Uh, although they did a lot of, you know, editing and, you know, yes, adjusting yeah. the physics of their environments and their bodies and whatever the hell they wanted to do. But yeah. Yeah. It was it was uh, embodied minds in a digital environment, definitely yeah. like a sensory element to it. Um, the conversations that move the plot forward, the ideas, amazing. Um, the conversations, not as good. Yeah, they're like just it's just like lists of science ideas and like exposition handed back and forth between two people, which is which is not good. But uh, you know, it okay. It's I trust us. It's worth waiting through. If you if you like hard science fiction, if you like big ideas and you like, mm, you know, a little bit of like mind bending stuff, it's gonna make you think differently. It's worth it. It's worth it. But yes, the dialogue is just atrocious. Yeah. Um, although, I mean, if you like hard science fiction, like we do, uh, then you're used to that. 
You know, I mean, it kind of <laughs> comes with the territory normally. Oh. Like, you know, the best ones uh, are well written too, but there are plenty of books where it's just like everyone agrees, like, yeah, the characters and dialogue are trash, but like, what about the I? What about this thing? Yeah, what would that's you do? A sad truth. Um, yes, 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 yes. So anyway, okay. So you won't be surprised if you're a fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's also a little hard to keep track of the characters for the first half of the book. There's not that many. Um, but I remember texting Brent because he recommended this to me. So I was reading it and I was like, okay, who's Paul and who's Durham and who's this Durham? And who's this Paul? And Brent was like, I don't think there's any characters named Paul. And then there's like a copy of Durham. So that's, and I made sense of that. But also there is a character named Paul and it's Paul Durham. So, <laughs> you know, that if that helps you keep track of how, yeah, how tough I it is. I never figured it. I never figured it out. I never learned any of the names. Um, I just learned to recognize like by the context, like, oh, this is that thread because there's, I don't know, there's three or four different like sort of characters we follow. And so eventually you will be able to tell them apart based on what's happening to them. But yeah, in terms of like human characteristics, I, I did not. Yeah. And uh, Maria is easy to keep track of. She's one of the main characters. She helps Paul in various ways. Paul Durham's becomes easier to keep track of once you realize there's, you know, a couple of them. Um, which is pretty <laughs> early, which is pretty early on. Um, and then, uh, the, the billionaire, uh, the, the finance guy, Thomas, um, is, he becomes trackable as well. Those are the three to keep an eye on. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But okay, let's get back to the good stuff. Let's yeah. Talk about let's talk copies. about some copies. Some copies. Yeah, would some you, clones. would you do it? Would you copy yourself? Would you oh, prestige we're gonna yourself? Go straight to the, straight to the top. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I thought about it the entire time I was reading this book. I thought about it when you and I talked about it before. And I still don't really know the answer. I don't think I would know until it was presented in front of me. If it were a scenario that were literally like this scenario, you know, they have the mathematical, the ability to copy you exactly the same. I still... <sighs> I think what's interesting about the idea is that our constantly as humans have tried to achieve immortality and talked about immortality, you know, the great uh, Chinese rulers of the past or uh, really any monarchs um, or wealthy people who think they're immortal. That current weird California, Los Angeles billionaire who's like trying to make himself younger and mostly just succeeding in making himself look like an alien. Yeah, yeah by using a blood boy that's his own son. Um uh, the, uh, yeah, the, I didn't yeah. know that part of it. <laughs> well, oh, uh, that's one of that's one of those guys. Anyways, um, the the idea of immortality, I as it's is is inachievable. Obviously, like people when they think of immortality, they think I, me, in this body with these senses and memories, live forever. Um, and and if you actually look at models that are put that are potentially plausible, like this mathematical uh, idea of mapping the, the brain and body in uh, Permutation City, then you see that maybe immortality is plausible, but it's not the way we, we think of it. Um, and you would have to be okay with a clone of yourself splitting and starting to have those experiences. Um, and I guess in theory, uh, to, to get back to your question, I'd be okay with it, um, but it's not it doesn't feel like I'm going to be a so, so here. Okay. So let me ask you to ask you this in this, in this way. So yes, your flesh and blood body, obviously like continues going. Part of you is going to experience death. The, the fork though, that clone, when it's first created, you would be aware you're in the computer program. It's not like a, the simulation, the computing power is expensive. So they're perfectly simulating the people, but not the environment to make it cheaper. So you can tell you're in the computer. You would know that you're the virtual one. Um, but at the beginning, you would th be identical. Um, so yeah, the question is, would would that version of yourself feel like it was you and immortal? And it feels like the answer is yes to me. I mean, of course you start diverging like as soon as you start having different experiences, but in that moment, right after the copy, I would argue like, yes, it's still you. They're both you in that moment. They're both the same person, um, which is really an interesting 
conundrum. But anyway, technically yes, but the the second again once once both of you begin having a different sensory relationship to the universe, you begin to be different people. That's where consciousness diverges. I mean, the first instant. And so, I mean, yes, it's pretty sweet for the copy, which I guess I would do for myself as like a gift. But once that person diverges off, like you're not achieving immortality. Like it's, there's no there's no way yeah. for me in this body to have that in this be, scenario. Yeah. Or It'd others. be hard for the copy though too, right? Because the copy is in there alone. I guess like unless all the rest of your family copied themselves at the same time. But like me on the outside, I get to keep like, being married to my wife that I love and having well, my you son. Could, like you, you could think about that ahead of time. I get, and that's one of the things they explore, right? Maria's mom, the whole reason Maria begins working for um, Paul Durham is that she wants to raise money to get her mom scanned, but her mom is uh, some sort of new new type of religion. She's religious and she believes that the the spirit should die with the body and, and disappear. Um, and so she doesn't want to be scanned. Um, and... The argument, the argument being, I have this one body in mind, and that's what I am supposed to be given, and it's different to have a clone, and I don't know what the implications would be for immortality or or, or my clone, and I, if I would be punishing them. Um, so there's a great philosophical argument between the two of them near the beginning of the book about just that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I th- I can see an argument both ways. Um. The most interesting thing that he did that's that I had not seen anybody do before is the copies. The thing that Paul does to himself is usually when people create the copies, the virtual version pretty immediately is like, nope, I want out. And they push the button to turn themselves on because it's deeply not enjoyable to be. There's no other mm, in the beginning. They're alone. Yeah. One of the copies explains the experience as this is like being buried alive. The, the first the first person to create the idea of copies who copies himself the copy says this is like being buried alive. So, yeah, because they're just like trapped alone in the simulation. So they all are choosing to kill themselves. But Paul creates a version of himself and then illegally changes it so that split version of him cannot turn itself off. And that's how he starts doing these crazy experiments on his own consciousness. Um, but yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. Being just like trapped in a computer simulation with like things that look like people but are not people. Like, yeah, that sounds pretty bad pretty bad. <laughs> and I guess the the whole the whole subject is why it is what makes it such a compelling novel because the it's beyond our ability to experience. We can only intellectualize about it. We're never going to be able to intuitively feel what it would be like to have a copy of ourselves because it's inherently beyond human, right? And beyond beyond our sensory uh experience of the universe. So and so I think it's why it's going to stick with me is because it's something you could never not like you could never stop thinking about. It's never going to resolve. There's no possibility. Um, yeah. And so uh, that's why my answer would be ever changing, I think. And you didn't answer. I never I didn't ask you. Would you copy yourself? Oh, um, I think yes. Yeah, I'm a, like I'm a crazy I'm a, I'm like a little crazy, you know, like I'm also like, oh, would you want to go to would you want to go to Mars? I'm like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> you might die. It's like, all right, okay. Well, it's okay. Um, so anyway, yeah, I think I would try it. Um, I definitely would want the version of me in the computer though to have the off switch. That seems uh pretty he he definitely like did something very mean to himself. Yeah, that's pretty cruel. I, I yeah. agree. Maybe maybe I do agree with you. I also think it depends how you f- you feel about yourself. Like oh, I like myself, so I feel like I would be doing myself a favor to give myself immortality if I could think of if I could think of the things that I'd need along the way and the people I'd need with me and if I could convince them, like you said, I think that's a that's a big part of it. Um, the other interesting thing that uh, he brings up is he kind of invents this new way of thinking um, that the copies have. Uh, they A lot of the copies join, are, are part of what they call solipsist nation, which is, you know, now that I'm a copy and I can do whatever I want in the simulation, I'm an I'm an army of one. I can be by myself, um, and that idea progresses throughout the novel um, in an, in is that an what interesting way. I just way. realized we should do our moment of of vocabulary. I don't. What is solipsism and solipsist? What does that mean? I don't know. Do you know? It means self obsessed, self absorbed. Oh, um, so they're saying that is like a positive thing. Interesting. Yeah, they're saying because we can do whatever we need and we don't need anyone else's support. Like 
we should be able to be like live by ourselves. It's the other side of the coin you were talking about, um, about bringing like family members and people in. It's like, well, if I can make other versions of myself and I can like reset my brain to like something else, or I can make myself feel any way I want to feel like I should be able to, to live by myself. Um, and like I said, it, it's explored in an interesting arc through the novel, through two other characters who we do not remember the names of. <laughs> That's I think like those are spoilers. Page three, buddy. No, it's not. That's like in the middle of the book, and is it's it's a spoiler. Okay, redacted, <laughs> redacted. I redacted the thing that I just spoiled. Um, it's explored in an interesting way. Let's say that for sure. Um, yeah, I really like Solipsis Nation too. The other thing, the other part of Solipsis Nation is there's this movement. No matter how rich you are, you can't run your simulation at like normal speed. It's like one seventh, I think is the fastest you can go. But that's doing that is like crazy expensive. So most people don't have the, the money. So you end up running yourself like, you know, a thousand times slower than real time. So the years are going, like you're experiencing so little of like what's going on in the rest of the world. And that's what makes your relationships fall apart and why you have to have this idea of like solipsism and being by yourself because you can't even uh, interact with the real world basically. Um, I thought that was a really interesting idea too. And, and, but some of them are arguing like, that's okay. We don't need the real world. Who cares if a thousand years go by out there for every year I live, I am a self-contained, like I am my own frame of reference. Yeah. And it's a cool book um, for that. The only other time I've really seen it is um, the, the Ken Liu short stories um, in Hidden Girl uh, collection in the Hidden Girl collection that was created into the Pantheon show um, of, of like the creation of AI or the creation of um, artificial consciousness in general, um, whether it be copied from a human or otherwise, um, usually you see like an, in science fiction, an established AI and like not how it was developing. And so these details about, you know, the, the copies experiencing time dilation, et cetera, uh, add to the, the ideas of like, okay, this is what it might turn into if taken from the beginning. Um, and I've, I found that a really cool element. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, uh, other just crazy thing to say about this book. I mean, it's sort of like implied here, but this book was written in 1994 and still has like very like present, interesting seeming science ideas. He's talking about neural networks and like, uh, in, in the machine learning, uh, um, application and, um, just all this other stuff. I mean, it's just, it's wild that this book was written 30 years ago now and it still feels like, like totally topical. The science feels like current and, and great. Yeah. I think he's really, really ahead on it. Um, the, the only, the only detail was that, uh, forgot to add numbers for inflation. <laughs> it's like the, <laughs> yeah, the deal Maria gets, she's like, I make $30,000 in six months. This is the most lucrative deal I've ever seen. It's like, yeah, it's well, in 2050. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a lot then. Um, also interesting is Greg Egan himself, who is a total recluse, um, mathematical programming wizard who writes all these hard science fiction from Australia, who claims that he does not have a picture of himself on the internet, nor does anybody else. And there have been some, some sci-fi fans who've tried to find them and said they found a picture of Greg Egan and here it is. And he said, nope, that's not me. Um, and that's fascinating. Uh, yeah, that's wild in this modern day and age, like a, yeah, whatever. He's not like a movie star, but he's written like popular books. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. I think a lot of us is like, oh, it could be cool to get off the grid. It's like too late. You're, you're on the grid forever. You could, you could cut it now and go live in the woods and it still, people would have all the info on your behavior previously and probably be able to model what you were doing in the woods. Uh, <laughs> it sounds like Greg Egan may have succeeded in actually truly being off the grid. So if, uh, if people loved this book, what else should they be reading? And we're going to talk a lot more about this book. We're going to do it post spoilers. If you want to hear about the big ideas and stuff, like definitely stick around even more big ideas, but, um, we're going to give you a chance to, to, you know, to not tune out and read. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and other recommendations, similar reading. Uh, the first one, I mentioned it before the hidden girl and other stories by Ken Liu, 
wonderful short story collection. Um, and, and there's a, there's a common thread of, of many stories that are wound together. Uh, like I said, made into the, the show, um, Pantheon on AMC plus, which is also great. Um, that's, that's exploring the idea of consciousness upload of a person and, and what that might look like and turn into. Okay. I'm going to go with, oh, and we also, we interviewed Ken Liu. Great. One of our most yeah. fun episodes. Yeah. If you, yeah. if you Love like Ken, Ken Liu. Liu, yeah, check that one out. Um, yeah, what you okay. got? Uh, I'm going to recommend uh, The Last Question, which is a short story by Isaac Asimov. And um, it's actually like available free online. We'll put the link in the episode notes. Um, but it basically looks at... The question is, how did the universe start and how will it end? And the book, not the book, the short story that's very digestible and short addresses that in a really interesting way. And it just sort of like... It's sat with me for a really long time. So a similar feeling of just like kind of blowing your mind about like what the universe might be like um, that felt right. So yeah, check that one out. And then my, uh, the last one's going to be Diaspora by Greg Egan, um, which is another popular Greg Egan. Uh, if you really like the hard, 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 hard science fiction and you like that element about Permutation City, you'll like to continue to explore um the intellectual nature uh, and possibility of consciousness in increasingly higher dimensions that starts in the far future. Um, it is technical. Um, so that this is for the, the people who really want to get hard with the math and the science. Um, but otherwise, we'll do post spoilers now for Permutation City. And uh, if you're leaving now, let us know if you would upload yourself. Either come join us on Discord or uh, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, Brent, what happens in the rest of the book? Okay. So there's the, the big reveal is like, what is Permutation City and how does it work? And so the idea is it's an ever expanding simulate a virtual computer that is preloaded with 12 people's copies in it, as well as the seed of uh, the seeds of a new auto verse and then two stowaways who are really interesting characters as well. But basically the idea here is they launch this virtual machine and in the program, it is expanding it's virtual computing power over time. So very quickly, it's eating up like an enormous amount of real world processing power to simulate this computer. And then they turn it off. But Paul Durham in doing these crazy experiments on himself has learned that if he like turns himself off for five minutes, his virtual, the virtual version of him can't tell. And he also did something to himself. Uh, it's a little hard to explain, but basically uh, the idea is if the pattern of we're a pattern, our thoughts are a pattern, what we are is a pattern. And in the universe, at the cosmic, the scale of cosmic time, like somewhere in the universe, a random alignment of things will always represent everything, definitely. Like everything will occur eventually. And so this self-replicating pattern of the virtual machine, when they turn it off on the servers on Earth, the next like tick in the computer program occurs when somewhere in the universe, some dust motes or photons or whatever randomly align themselves such that it like aligns to the next tick of the computer. And from the point of view of the people inside that computer program, they can't tell the difference. They can't tell that whatever, 500,000 years have passed between ticks. They don't care because from their perception inside, it's continuous. And so the idea is that they create this ever expanding virtual computer system with them, the virtual copies of themselves inside it. So they will truly live like beyond the life of the solar system, like longer than any of the copies back on earth could possibly live like literally forever. Um, and they have this self-replicating, uh, or sorry, this, this ever expanding universe with them. They have the rules for what they call an auto verse basically. Um, so that they have something to look at and it's interesting. So it's like a new universe that they're creating. And then there's and a new universe that they're letting create itself. A planet yes, that they a, a planet that they've built to evolve its own laws and its own creatures, etc. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They basically they're setting up like the fundamental rules of physics and then letting the thing evolve. So they have like something to watch and see. Um 
And yeah, and then there's two stowaways who sneak themselves into the code. So they get to keep living forever, but they can't actually interact with any of the other people. Um, and so they become really interesting characters because they have to live so long, like literally by themselves, just watching. Um, so yeah, that's the setup, or not the setup. That's the that's the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, some other stuff happens. The yeah. you know the 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 planet that they've created ends up um, the laws of physics that they've written for it end up superseding the laws of the autoverse and the permutation city that they're in, uh, and so the the city is it becomes in danger of collapse and and does collapse. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. The, yeah. the stowaway uh, tract is really interesting. Those are the Solipsis Nation characters. They learn that maybe mortality is a good thing, and they could, co- you know, this the one the one man who's wanted to be alone has made so many copies of himself and and done so many things and lived so many lifetimes that the the woman who wants people around who he's still weighed with, um, he just creates copies of himself that are all those different lifetimes he lived and they're different people uh, in theory because of that. Yeah, and and there's an example of those lifetimes. Like to keep himself sane and interested, one of the ones we get to see, for instance, is he's like, you know what? I've always like sort of been interested in woodworking. I'm going to make a version of myself that like just makes just does woodworking all day, every day. I'm going to give myself like the best tools. And he just like makes table legs for like 80 years in a row until he's tired of making table legs. And then he lets himself remember that like, oh yeah, I've been alive for like 7,000 years. And I've, I've, I like collected beetles for a while. And like, he's just like sort of, sort of killing himself and restarting himself with like a different thing he's obsessed with over and over and over and over again to try to make sense of this immortal life. It's crazy. Yeah, that part was really compelling to me is the idea that you could have, I mean, uh, as one avenue to immortality, you could feel like you were a regular alive person, but when you get to the end of the road, you remember there's something that remembers for you in your brain that you can flip a switch and start over however you'd like. New, New character. Redesign the, you go back to the character design window on yeah, the RPG. that's totally right. Yeah, um, that's totally right. And so that was really cool. And then the, the idea that they they come to terms with their mortality because they've been stranded in the city that's collapsing um, by all of the people who created it who left. Um, and they're going to be mortal now. And they're like, maybe that's okay. Live one last life. Yeah, and then the people, the main avenue, so Paul Durham, Maria, and then like the 12 billionaires who he recruited, what they end up doing is like making children, like copies of themselves that they're changing and altering in certain ways um, and like making a society and they're doing politics and they're like doing a new society, basically a human society. And they give everybody a bunch of processing power to play with, to play with. Um, So that's sort of the other, the second avenue that we see of immortality, which is like, you know, I don't know hanging out the big the big hang <laughs> no, and also an society. interesting point about an interesting point about how i mean maybe it just because it's from a human mind greg egan but we can't remove the idea of offspring from immortality you know that's how we represent immortality with mortal lives um and and even in the copy in the copyville most people are kind of repeating the same pattern um yeah, so the the idea, the overall idea is, is called the mathemat- Ensemble Mathematical Universe Hypothesis um, and has been put out by uh, another scientist who I forget the name of, but he, uh, Max Tegmark. Um, but I think it, I couldn't figure it out, but it sounds like he made it after Greg Egan wrote the book. Anyways, the idea that math is physics like fundamentally the universe is just math and that's all it is. It's really crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And the one that I keep coming back to is this idea that like, if we are just a a pattern, which we are, we're just a, it's just a, you know, mm, you know, we're a network of cells that are firing in, in patterns and by like the law of large numbers and the scale of the universe, like something out there will assemble itself into the same pattern that my brain is in right now and right now and right now. And so if you, you know, I think there's sort of an argument to this that like every pattern sort of like keeps persisting and reoccurring forever. It's just a really interesting, crazy idea that like any organism 
will sort of like continue to exist in the ether forever. It's like, it's like sort of like heaven kind of, um, I don't know what your sense perception would be in like that nat- native state. It would just be random noise, I guess, because it's kind of like hell then. Anyway, it's a crazy idea. <laughs> yeah. Again, not things we can ever, ever, ever hope to internalize or in- instinctualize, <laughs> feel it. Yeah. Um, feel in that way, uh, just intellectualize about. And that's what's so fascinating about the book. And it also wraps up nicely. Um, you know, even though the characters aren't so great, all of the different, the, the kind of the three main tracks that we follow from the beginning do have kind of cool um, endings. You know, yeah. we already talked about the the stowaways and, and what happens uh, to the to the non stowaways in the city, but there's a there's another character, Thomas, the the billionaire who has just lived his whole life feeling awful about a single event, um, where he uh, killed his girlfriend basically, and what he does with his copy is uh, undo that event and essentially put himself in a hell to experience that uh, the life where he undoes the event and faces the consequences. That have been yeah yeah he 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 the copy he put into the the universe was not his current one that had been living virtually for a long time it was the one that got created just when he was dying and then he sort of he sets it up that later the the self that's loading himself into the permutation city sets it up so that it's that version of himself that was just as he was dying at the end of his mortal like his body's life and then in an environment where he would be like tortured by his the memory of what he had done and having to relive it forever and yeah he like he like created hell for himself and that then gives you all sorts of crazy ideas about like whoa if we can do mind uploading then like punishment for crimes gets really different like maybe you make a copy of the person and then like what are you going to make them I don't, you could literally send them in hell forever you can make like Dante's Inferno and have them make them live in that eternally um, anyway just as like there's all sorts of crazy ideas that come out of it as usual with this book with the human experience what would our minds create with a non-human experience and then eventually uh, like in Diaspora which I recommended uh, what types of things that not a human mind would <laughs> create would create. Uh, anyways, as you can tell, even summarizing stuff in this book, uh, gets a little murky. I think we're doing a good job, but it just is that complicated. So (laughs) if you're a hard science fiction fan, this one's for you. We liked it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, this is, um, yeah, I would love to, this is definitely one where I'd love to hear what other people thought. So yeah, definitely jump on discord, drop us a comment, let us know what you think. Cause it's, this is a really, really interesting one to, to talk about. All right. We'll see you next time for the rankings. Yeah, good to see you, man. All right, peace.